Hey, I'm Matt Orfala, and I had the great opportunity to interview Rutger Bregman, the author of Utopia for Realists. We talked a lot about universal basic income, its history, and a lot of other stuff. Let's get to it. First of all, thank you, Rutger, for joining me, of course. Your research and writing, it is what got me interested in basic income a few years really? ago. Really? Yes. Yeah. Um, really? Oh, that's so great to hear. And um, let's see. Okay, you're ready for some questions now, though, huh? All right, here we mm-hmm. go. So uh, regarding Nixon's plan to end poverty with free money to the poor, mm-hmm. in your writing, you describe Nixon's family assistance plan as a partial basic income, but it had a work requirement element to it, which doesn't sound mm-hmm. like the universal basic income that people are talking about today, where everyone would get a basic income regardless of whether they work or not. Mm-hmm. Did Nixon's family assistance plan always have a work requirement? Can you tell us the story of its el- evolution and why it en- sure. ended up failing? Sure. Well, this is actually a pretty fascinating and bizarre history. So what Nixon did is that he said in public, uh, when he gave speeches about his plan, he said, there's going to be a work requirement. Uh, Behind doors, he said, I don't give a damn about the work requirement. And we know that, you know, there wasn't such a thing as as any work requirement. You know, there wasn't a serious work requirement. You could just get the, the basic income. But he used the rhetoric and the language of workfare to defend a basic income. It's pretty bizarre. And the reason that he did that is even more, well, it's a very long story, actually. It goes all the, all the way back to 19th century England, where sort of the first basic income scheme was implemented uh, just after the French Revolution. And this was called the Spien and Lens system. And many economists and historians thought for a long time that 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 system had been a disaster. Now, Nixon heard about that and suddenly he was a little bit afraid and decided to change his rhetoric. There was an advisor, Martin Anderson, big fan of Ayn Rand, who sort of wrote a paper for him that said, well, look what happened in the 19th century in England. It was really a disaster. You know, it was only later that historians found out that in reality, the report that showed that this first basic income experiment was a complete disaster was actually, that report was a complete fabrication. Um, It was published in 1834. Uh, It was the basis for the new poor law. Now, everyone who has read Charles Dickens knows that that was like the most evil systems of social security the the world has ever seen. Um, And, uh, but, but, you know, the the shadow of Spienheim lens stretched all the way until the 1960s. Nixon changed his mind, changed his rhetoric, his basic income proposal didn't come to pass, and then Reagan and Thatcher used his language, used his rhetoric to implement their workfare schemes that we are still stuck with today. So I'm summarizing it very briefly now. I need 5,000 words in the book (laughs) to explain the story, but it's a completely bizarre story. But, you know, to to make my answer really short, yes, Nixon's proposal was a real basic income proposal. It was a modest basic income, but it was a basic income with no real work requirement. Um, And so why did it end up failing? Well, there are a few reasons, actually. The the most important reason uh, was that the Democrats voted against it in the Senate. So it got through the House of Representatives twice with a large majority, in fact. And then what happened in the Senate is that the Democrats said, well, this is a great idea, but we want a higher basic income. We want more. Uh, So they voted against it twice. Um, And then what happened in 1978 was a quite fatal discovery in one of the negative income tax or basic income experiments that was going on in Seattle. Uh, What researchers discovered is that the divorce rate had gone up by 50 percent. So at that point, uh, especially conservatives said, we can't have a basic income. I mean, this will make women much too independent. We can't have that. Uh, It was only later, about 10 years later, that researchers found out that a statistical mistake had been made. And in reality, the divorce rate didn't go up at all. So it's really a bizarre history full of contingencies and ironies. uh, And I think I think it really shows you that history isn't determined by big laws of, of history or nature or whatever. It's really the coincidences that matter. Um, And that's sometimes that makes you pessimistic in this sense, but it can also make you hopeful because, uh, you know, when we think about the future of basic income, just five years ago, no one knew what it was. Now it's everywhere. Let's see where we are in five years. 
Yeah, amazing that, I mean, just repeatedly through history, false data really framed a, a false understanding of the effect of money for the poor with uh, exactly. with this speed exactly. ham land uh, experiment. Is that or study yeah. where, where yeah. they I mean, way back in the day where the people who did it uh, already did, you know, wrote the the results before even ever analyzing any data, if they even did, mm-hmm. did it at all. Yeah. Um, and then again, with this, you know, the uh, data falsely saying that a basic income would lead to higher divorce rates. It's, it is really fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's incredibly. I, I, I mean, the, the big experience, like the Spin and Lent report was a complete fabrication and that was really influential. And we had this very good studies in the 1970s in Canada and the US, and they were not influential at all. There was only the one statistic that was influential turned out to be wrong as well. But I mean, the, I think one of the most interesting stories in the book is about what happened in Canada. Um, when I first wrote about this, again, four or five years ago, uh, almost no one knew about this basic income experiment that happened in a small t- town called Dauphin. I really had to re- rely on like local Canadian newspapers and obscure <laughs> reports from archives. But now the story is everywhere. Um, and what happened here is that, you know, that experiment lasted for four years. They had 2,000 boxes full of data after that. And then a new government came into power and said, uh, well, we won't give you any money to analyze the results. Uh, and then it was forgotten for 25 years until a Canadian professor, Evelyn Frigier, discovered the data, did the analysis and discovered that it had been a huge success. You know, healthcare costs went down, kids performed better in school, domestic violence went down, mental health complaints went down, uh, people didn't work any less. The only ones who worked a little less were new mothers and students. So again, yeah, it's it's uh, full of ironies. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it all came down to like what information actually got out and in influential. And I'm going to ask you more about, uh, you know, like the media's current role in this uh, later. Um, not that the media in particular had a big effect on um, those mm-hmm. historical examples we talked about. But uh, let me ask you. So you, you did mention that the Democrats killed it killed Nixon's basic income plan because they thought it was too low an amount. But I was watching mm-hmm. uh, Milton Friedman on uh, the old PBS series, Free to Choose. And mm-hmm. um, he uh, picked out, he said that the chief obstacle uh, mm-hmm. that Senator Pat Moynihan demonstrated in his book on the Nixon program, which I'm, is your source too, he said the chief obstacle to getting it enacted was a welfare bureaucracy. Um, mm-hmm. Is there truth to that as well? Can you explain how the welfare bureaucracy played some role in killing the bill, if that's true? Well, obviously, I mean, there are always people who benefit from the current system, right? But I, I wouldn't want to overplay that argument. You know, what I, what I discovered, for example, in the Netherlands, where I live, is that the biggest proponents of a basic income are people working right now in the welfare bureaucratic systems. Mm. You know, the people who have to uh, give the courses to get people back into jobs or to try and control people and see if they don't, uh, you know, um, uh, if they follow the rules, et cetera, et cetera. Those people working on the local level with these kind of rules and bureaucracies, they know more than anyone that we need a different system, that this is like completely ludicrous, incredibly expensive, doesn't get people into jobs, it's very, very humiliating for the people who have to rely on it. Um, so, well, I know that Friedman was obviously against everything that had to do with government or the, <laughs> the G word, but I wouldn't want to overplay that, uh, that argument. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I live in Washington, D.C., you know, the belly of the beast, and I, I meet people... Every so often, that you know, they work. They work in the welfare uh, industry bureaucracy, and like mm-hmm. you said, they. I hear a lot of stories about how it's it's a mess. Just one example recently, just a few days ago, a woman was telling me, uh, you know, that they're giving poor people essentially no money to take surveys to collect data, um, you know, to to figure out how to help them. But meanwhile, they're paying researchers huge sums of money to look, look over this and paying you know, the poor people nothing 
for this data. It just seems like you, you, I know. You, it's, it's crazy, yeah. but it's, it's time and time again, what's happening around the Western world is that we are paying through the nose for a huge, a vast industry of bureaucratic paternalists who are just combating the symptoms of poverty and combating the symptoms of people in debt. Well, we should simply hand over their salaries to the poor, their pay to help. You know, that's often much more effective just to solve the problem than to manage it. You, you, I, I've got a big part in my book, Utopia for Realists, about um, um, how we can uh, solve homelessness. And it's very easy. You know, we can solve poverty with money and you solve a lack of homes. You solve it with homes. You know, it's a very effective program. Um, that's being implemented uh, worldwide right now, also in the US. Actually, I've got the story in the book is about uh, a politician in Utah, of all places, who became convinced that we should give all the chronic homeless free apartments simply because it's cheaper. You know, it's really, really expensive for everyone if we keep our homeless on the streets in terms of higher health care costs, more crime, uh, police, the judicial system. Uh, we waste a huge amount of of talent, people that would, could, uh, could work and pay taxes, etc., etc., etc. So, yeah, what I really try to do in the book is provide solid evidence for win-win solutions, you know, mm. that we'll all benefit from. Yeah, speaking of win-win, I mean, I, I think it's, I personally, I think basic income is an easy sell for like the Milton Friedman crowd, libertarian, the anti-government crowd, which is a pretty big crowd these days, uh, because it does, you know, it would eliminate government bureaucracy in favor of a, you know, simpler uh, program that would ensure all citizens a basic standard of living. Now, I think mm -hmm. most of the pushback will come from establishment politicians from all sides who are obsessed with jobs as a solution. I, I mean, mm -hmm. and um, so let me ask you a question about the job guarantee versus the basic income guarantee. Um, mm -hmm. I mean... It's been widely reported, at least on the internet, that Martin Luther King was uh, for a guaranteed income, and he mm -hmm. did call a guaranteed income the most effective solution to poverty. But he did also talk mm -hmm. about a job guarantee, you know, in in his last book, as an, as another uh, option to eliminate poverty. So, Rutger, what is it that makes basic income guaranteed a better solution mm -hmm. than a job guarantee? Well, let me just say this: I'm I'm not totally against a job guarantee. I don't think it's an evil solution or whatever. I just think that basic income is even better. Um, and there's a very simple reason for that, especially in the long run. I think that people are much better to decide for themselves what to do with their lives than the government is. You know, in the short run, especially during a recession, sure, let the government create more jobs. That's very good. I mean, that's standard anti-cyclical anti policy, very smart. Uh, but you know, especially in the long run, I think that basic income is a pro-work policy. It would give everyone the freedom to decide for themselves what to do with their lives. And there are a lot of jobs that are not paid very well right now and that not many people want to do from garbage men, cleaners, you name it. And those wages would have to rise with a basic income. And that's great. But a basic income will also provide people the opportunity to do jobs uh, for lower wages. For example, if you're an artist and you can always fall back on your basic income and you really want to start painting, well, that's really hard. You know, it's really hard at the beginning of your career as an artist to make money with it. But if you, if you could just earn a salary of like $400, $500 each month, plus your basic income, you could suddenly start doing it. So that's, that's actually a pro work policy. The thing is we need to completely rethink what work is. You know, nowadays, we're obsessed with pushing people into jobs um, that are often jobs that the people who have them themselves don't care about. There's a recent poll in the UK that found that 37% of British workers think they have a complete bullshit job that doesn't add anything of value. Now, that is the biggest taboo of our time. We should be talking much more about that. What is work? What is wealth? What do we really value? Yeah, you, you mentioned... Um you know, brought up the phenomenon of bullshit jobs, how a lot of people consider mm -hmm. their jobs bullshit jobs with like no meaning, very little use, you know, usefulness to society. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and you even said uh, that you that you should never underestimate capitalism's ability to create bullshit jobs. And I want to ask you about that because, I mean, it seems like we've all been taught and it sure seems like capitalism is a mechanism that eliminates bullshit jobs. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, like take Instagram, for example, it replaced Kodak. Instagram with nine employees replaced Kodak with over 100,000 mm-hmm. employees because they offered a more, you know, a better, more efficient product. Um, so isn't that capitalism eliminating BS jobs? Um, mm-hmm. Can you give some examples of how capitalism creates uh, bullshit jobs? Sure. Um, a very easy example in the country where I live, the Netherlands, is tax lawyers. So we are, for U.S. companies, the biggest tax paradise around the globe. You know, bigger than the Cayman Islands, bigger than, than Luxembourg. Almost all big American companies send a lot of money to Holland to pay no taxes. Now, that gives us a lot of employment, right? A lot of people working here in the financial sector, earning a lot of money. Um, but at the end of the day, if you give them one beer or maybe two, they'll admit that, that what they're doing is completely useless. It's even destructive. So the fact that there is demand for something doesn't mean it makes the world a better place. You know, you, you, you really see that in the, in the financial sector, especially, uh, but you see that also in government. I mean, there are also so many consultants right now thinking about, I don't know, co-creation in the network society, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is so much nonsense going on right now and everyone, everyone knows it, you know, it's, it's not a secret. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that's what I, what, I, what I meant when I said that we shouldn't underestimate capitalism's extraordinary ability to come up with new bullshit jobs. Because, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about robots taking our jobs. Sure, that's going to happen, but, but it's already happening and it has already happened. Uh, if you just go back 50 years in time and read the newspaper, you could just copy paste the articles about robots that were published then and republish them again. I mean, it's basically the same things, the thing that people were saying back then, the robots are going to take all our jobs. Um, what people underestimated back then is that capitalism would create new jobs that don't even need to exist. You yeah. know, that's, and if we don't update our ideas about what real work is, what we really value, if we do not introduce a universal basic income that will give everyone the opportunity to decide for themselves what kind of work they want to do, then this can go on for, for years. I mean, now it's 30% of all jobs that are bullshit. It could be 40%. It could be 50%. I mean, if we stick to, our, to this ideology, it could be 100%. You know, that all the real work will be done by robots and we are just sending emails to each other all day um, and se- writing reports that no one cares about while we stick to this ideology of work. I mean, yeah. that, that could happen. And that's, that's why my book is really a book of ideas. You know, I think that technology is not destiny. History is in the end really uh, governed by ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you. You mentioned consultants as an example of potential bullshit jobs. And again, mm-hmm. I have to say, living in D.C., lots of consultants, and they'll tell me, you know, it's like it's, it seems like they just get paid just to tell their employer what they know they already want to hear. I mean, it's exactly. incredible. And I think that's, that's what's so brilliant about it, because the bullshit job, the, is, the concept is from David Graeber, an American anthropologist. And I think what's so brilliant about, about his definition is that people decide it for themselves. So it's not me saying it. I mean, I'm a historian. People may think, well, you, you've got a bullshit job. Well, I, I, I'm free to decide for myself. Thank you. Uh, but if people are saying it about their own jobs, who are we to say, no, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. your job is really, really useful. And if it's, no, 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 my job is not useful. I mean, that's paternalistic, right? Yeah. But that's basically what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, when you go around, uh, you know, with these utopian ideas, like a basic income, um, you said that, I mean, unsurprisingly, you, you get a lot of people who um, don't believe that it's possible. And you say you think the reason or a reason that a lot of people respond negatively to your utopian I- ideas mm-hmm. is because people are conditioned to think negatively by the media. Can you mm-hmm. explain why that is or what it is about the media that would make people oppose a basic income and think mm-hmm. more negatively in general? Well, the news is always about exceptions, right? The news is always about violence, terrorism, corruption, people committing benefit fraud or whatever. It's always about the 0.1% or the 0.00001%. It's never about what happens every day. It's about what happens today. Um, So if you watch a lot of the news, at the end of the day, you'll have a really bleak image of human nature because you're only hearing about things that go wrong, about people that mess up, about people that are violent, that are people want to rig the system, et cetera, et cetera. And a basic income policy is 
is determined uh, or is based on the majority of people. It's not the, you know, the, the, the system of social security we have now is based on like the 0.0% of all people that, that want to commit fraud. You know, if, if everyone would be like that, then the system we have now is perfect. The problem is that 99% of all people want to make something of their lives. We've got a mountain of evidence that most people are pretty nice, that, that they, they want to get up in the morning, do something, contribute to the common good. That's what we find time and time again in all the basic income experience around the globe. Um, and yeah, I, I really do believe that, you know, our, our very high media consumption up to five hours a day of television in the US on average. It's not very good for our image of human nature. So I always say to people who are pessimistic, it's just throw your television out of the window and read more books, talk to real people. <laughs> now, I mean, you work in the media yourself uh, as a mm -hmm. writer mostly, and I mean, I, I appreciate the work you do tackling complex issues like poverty and possible solutions to poverty, but I'm concerned about the future of journalism. <laughs> Uh, because mm -hmm. news outlets are publishing less and less in-depth investigative journalism in favor of more clickbait articles like, you know, what mm -hmm. Kim Kardashian eat for breakfast because it's easier to produce and generates more clicks and more money. It's just, just more profitable. Mm -hmm. um, and also another problem is now in our, you know, internet media environment where content is free and making money off advertising, mm -hmm. um, that's not even working anymore either thanks to ad block software. Uh, YouTube is demonetizing mm -hmm. political content. I don't know if you've heard about that. But um, mm -hmm. uh, so content, yes, we have crowdfunding, but uh, that doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem sustainable mm -hmm. because uh, incomes are falling at, mm -hmm. in America, at least. And as incomes continue to fall, you know, most Americans won't be able to spend, they'll just be spending mm -hmm. less money on crowdfunding. So, Without some radical change, you know, large majority of people willing and able to do this quality journal journalism in mm -hmm. the public's interest uh, will not be getting sustainable funding. So I'm curious how you think a basic income would affect the future of journalism, because I'm worried it may be necessary to save journalism and the Internet from becoming just completely swallowed by shallow self-promotion mm -hmm. and clickbait. What, mm -hmm. what do you think? Well, let me first say that I work at a... Dutch online journalism platform called The Correspondent. And we started just four years ago um, and we are completely ad free. So no ads at all. We are entirely funded by members. Um, we've got 55,000 uh, now, so quite substantial already. And we're going to start next year in the US as well. Nice. Uh, and the whole idea behind The Correspondent is that in the first place, we don't cover the news. Because I said that if you watch a lot of the news at the end of the day, you know exactly how the world is not working. So we want to talk more about the forces that are in the background, but that really determine our lives, you know, from climate change to the decline in child mortality since the 1990s, new ideas about how we can make this world a better place, etc. So it's a different kind of journalism. But the model behind it, the, the, the financial model behind it is also different. Uh, as I said, we don't rely on ads. And what we say to our members is, well, we basically are trying to create a movement. So we've experimented, for example, with different pop-ups. Everyone can read our articles or all members can share our articles for free. So if you want, you can just read oral articles. Um, so the, the reach of our, of our journalism is as, is as high as possible. Um, but then when people come to our website and they aren't member yet, they see a pop-up. And what many journalism organizations do is say, hey, uh, we see that you're not paying for our stuff yet. Um, maybe you should, because then you get all these material benefits. You know, you get this newspaper or uh, we'll send you an email every day or whatever. We do something completely different. What we say is, hey, we, you're not a member yet. Do you want to join our movement? Do you want to change the Netherlands? Do you want to make more of this kind of journalism possible? So we really try to appeal to the idealism of people. And it's incredibly effective. I mean, we're growing at a, we're the only growing news organization or journalism organization in the Netherlands right now. Um, I think that that's, that's really the future of quality journalism. For a long time, quality journalism could rely on both subscription and ads. And now you see subscriptions going down and ads going all the way up. Uh, and then at the end, there's no journalism left. So what you should do is get rid of all ads and solely rely on your members and make it a movement. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, but my concern is that 
that's not i mean if the trend continues of you know uh, work full time work being converted to part time work with less pay less job mm-hmm. security for most americans i mean mm-hmm. i i just i'm just very concerned that well you know, and i i mean i obviously agree that a basic uh, income would help here uh-huh. i mean there's there's one other fascinating phenomenon that i discovered in the past few years and that's the phenomenon of the part time bullshit job so what happens here, and you see this a lot in journalism, is that people do work or journalists do work for companies they hate, you know, writing ads content or whatever. Uh, and then they use that money to do investigative journalism into exactly those kind of companies. So in modern capitalism, we finance the stuff that we really care about with bullshit. You know, it's, it's, it's completely upside down. Um, and obviously, a basic income would really, really help here because then people would immediately be able to to start with the valuable stuff and, and skip the nonsense. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, I mean, in your books and articles, you don't just um, write about basic income. You write about other mm-hmm. utopian ideas like open borders. Um, mm-hmm. So I think many people were surprised when during your RSA talk, for example, uh, mm-hmm. you said Donald Trump is the most utopian thinker of our time. Um, Mm -hmm. how how is Donald Trump a utopian thinker in your eyes? Well, every milestone of civilization that we have right now was once a utopian fantasy. And the end of slavery, democracy, equal rights uh, for men and women. It was all crazy, ludicrous once, right? And, And here we are. So what I think utopian thinking is about making the unrealistic, uh, realistic, making the impossible inevitable. And that that works both ways. So just two years ago, we found the whole idea of Donald Trump as president of the U.S. completely crazy. And here we are. You know, just a few years ago, the alt-right was a fringe phenomenon, and now it's the establishment. So uh, that's what I mean by the biggest utopian thinker. I think that political change is really determined by the people on the fringes of the debate, not by the people in the center. You know, they just keep the system as it is. If you want to change the world, you need to be unrealistic, unresponsible, impossible, <laughs> you name it, because then <laughs> then you just redefine what is what is seen as possible. Now, for most of uh, Western history, of industrial history, it was the left that was impossible and unrealistic. You know, that, that has always been the case. All these ideals that I've been talking about, like the end of slavery, democracy, the welfare state, or leftist or progressive ideals. The problem nowadays is that the left has completely forgotten how to think in utopian terms. You know, it only is knows what it's against. Yeah. And it's against a lot of things, you know, against austerity, against the establishment, against homophobia, against racism, against growth, against blah, blah, blah. There's even a book recent, recently published with the title Against Everything. <laughs> Well, great. I'm, 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 I'm against all those things as well. But you also need to be for something. You know, you need to have a vision of where you want to go. So and let that vision be unrealistic because you then redefine what is possible. So, yeah, you need two things, an unrealistic vision of where you want to go and a very realistic plan of what you want to do tomorrow to take that first small step to get there. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and um, you know, Trump. Man, I mean, saying we're going to build the wall and have Mexico pay for it. We're going to totally dismantle the EPA. These are very exactly, you know, yeah. utopian thoughts. And yes. that is utopian, right? Yes, yeah. you're right. Um, so, yeah, God, I, I hope uh, the left... I think that he uh, understands much better how politics works than mm-hmm. many people in the center. You know, you've got all these smart people working at think tanks and policy wonks and blah, blah, blah. And many of them don't really understand how you can change the world. Yeah, they, you know? they just criticize him. <laughs> Instead of coming up with their own utopian ideas to uh, push back against exactly. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what, what's also really important is to develop a different kind of language. Um, so, uh, for example, what the left often does is frame their arguments in terms of caring. Oh, here are all these poor people. We should pity them and we should help them. Well, well guess what? Most people hate the Good Samaritan. They don't want to be helped by some kind of paternalist who, who's so fond of him, him or herself. Um, what you should do is, is f- use right-wing language to defend progressive ideals. And that, that's what I try to do in my book, you know, use the language of efficiency, innovation, growth, progress, you name it, and use that language to defend a basic income, for example. Venture I think a basic income is, 
Like you, I was just yeah, going to say. That's it. <laughs> basic income is venture capital for the people. It's incredibly inf- efficient. It has a huge return of investment. It will give people the freedom to decide for themselves what to do with their lives. It will get rid of the nanny state uh, that's that's trying and all the paternalists, et cetera, et cetera. It will enable people to be innovative, to be entrepreneurial, et cetera, et cetera. You see, it's all right wing language that yeah. I'm using here mm-hmm. to, to defend the basic income. And yeah, and it, it really does have appeal to, you know, the right and Republicans here in the U.S. Um, exactly, it should. Yeah. Um, but let me ask you, um, um, a lot of basic income supporters that I'm in touch with are worried that Trump or Republican Party would frame basic income as an anti-immigration policy uh, because mm-hmm. it would go to only legal American citizens. Do you think it would be good if Trump starts talking about basic income? Or would you, do you think there's um, you know, reason to be concerned that basic income will get framed as an anti-immigrant immigrant policy mm-hmm. rather than a humanitarian policy like you frame it as? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a really difficult decision. I, I have no idea about what to think about Trump. I mean, just, just a few days ago, he was completely against doing anything in Syria, and now he's bombing the country. I mean, that, that it's very hard to say, <laughs> to say what, you, what you want him to think, or if you want him to think at all. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just better if he watches television and tweets. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, I mean, this episode in American history will pass, you know, hmm. and especially in the long run, I think I'm, 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 I'm 28 um, and real history isn't determined in just a few years by politicians who are now working in Washington. You know, real history is determined by ideas and those ideas always originate on the fringes, on people blogging, on people making YouTube videos, on people talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. And then when everyone <laughs> is convinced that we need to talk about a new idea, then politicians will talk about it as well. So Donald Trump is, I think, basically the result of a very long process. It's not the beginning of something. Mm. I mean, Rucker, thanks for joining me. I mean, I could talk with you for a while. I have lots of questions, <laughs> but... um. Why don't you, you know, you leave us with uh, anything else you want to say and definitely, you know, tell us all about your new book. Sure. Um, well, I'd just like to emphasize that I meet a lot of people uh, that have read my book, but are a little bit, I don't know, pessimistic and think, that, well, this will never happen. What I think is really important to, as I said, stop watching the television, meet real people um, and, and spread the word. Understand that, you know, real politics isn't being done in places like Washington or Westminster, but it's just being done at the local level where people come together and talk about new ideas. And then, you know, you never get to utopia in one big leap or something, one big step. Uh, It's a lot of small steps. And then after 20 or 30 years, you can see that you've you've, uh, walked an extraordinary distance. Um, I think that's what it's all about. But cynicism is our biggest enemy. All right. Thanks again for joining me, Rucker. Uh, I'll, I'll let you get back to that. Your important work. Okay. Keep it going, man. Keep it going. Keep it up. Love it. <laughs>